Hello, and welcome to Chatty AF, the anime feminist podcast. Today, we're starting our watch along of the underappreciated gem Deno Coil. My name is Caitlin, and I'm a writer and editor for Anime Feminist, as well as writing for The Daily Dot and my own blog, I Have a Heroin Problem. I'm joined today by Vry and Peter. Why don't you two introduce yourselves? Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Vry Kaiser. I'm an editor at Anime Feminist. Uh, I freelance all over the web and write fiction sometimes, too. If you go to my Twitter, at Writer Vry, and look at my pinned post, you can uh, find a list of everything I do everywhere. And if you want to listen to the other podcast I co-host, you can find it on Twitter, at TrashPod. And I'm Peter Phobian. I'm an Associates Features Editor at Crunchyroll and a contributor and editor at Anime Feminist. Let's start off with a little bit of background. Uh, Deno Coil came out in two th- 2007 and was the direct- directorial debut of the animator Mitsuo Iso, um, who unfortunately has not directed anything since, although he does have a new anime coming out sometime next year, um, which it's about time because this show is amazing. Um, when it first came out, it was, uh, considered to be, uh, pioneering in the, uh, world of sort of achievable science fiction. The, uh, reviewers were sort of predicting that, uh, was that, um, uh, technology would emulate it. Uh, it takes place in the near future when augmented reality is becoming the norm in day-to-day life. The heroine, Yuko, also known as Yasuko, moves to Daikoku City, an experimental town, uh, fully integrating the cyber world and the real world with her family and falls in with a group of uh, preteen hackers. At the same time, another Yuko, who they nickname Isako, transfers into their class as well and displays hacking abilities way beyond anything that they know or are of capable of. So. I have watched this series already. Um, I watched it a couple years ago before it was uh, licensed and I was pretty much blown away by it. It is probably like just one of the best um, anime series I've ever seen on like multiple levels. Um, But you guys are watching it for the first time. So, what are your first impressions of these first six episodes? Yeah, sure, I'll go first. Um, This is a weird experience for me. Uh, It's been a while. I think this is the first time that I've been on a watch-along where I didn't know at least a little bit about, or, or... Um, or had watched a little bit of the show we were doing, and I am coming into this one completely blind because, you know, there were a lot of shows in the mid to late 2000s that, because it was before streaming, just kind of fell through the cracks because they were too weird or small to get picked up. So it's interesting to be watching this completely blind for a change, and deliberately so. Um, It's not... It, it cert- watching this made me realize that it's been a long time since I watched a series that was specifically about uh, younger children, which is an interest like not not in a bad way. Just it, it's an interesting shift. Uh, it ended up reminding me a lot of Digimon in these first couple episodes, particularly mm-hmm. the um, the movie that was later remade into Summer Wars, which you know I <laughs> I, I, I like I like Digimon. Oh, two kids are best kids. Fight me. Um, and, you know, it's it's one of those shows that I don't know that I'd keep watching it if we weren't doing a watch along because I like it, but it hasn't really intensely grabbed me yet. Like, I, I like a lot of the characters. I like, I like the ideas. Um, I'm not super into shows that throw a lot of techno babble at you, although this one is, I will admit, better at it than most. It, it for the most part, is fairly naturalistic at, um, in, it, at uh, weaving in its exposition and world building which i really respect so also uh isako is clearly terrible and trash and therefore is my child i have adopted her (laughs) there's a lot of trash children in this show but in a realistic way because they're 12 and 12 year olds are terrible i really hate daichi and kyoko a lot kyoko's the uh the little sister. The little sister. Oh, the one who just calls everything poop. I know that that is realistic. I have been around <laughs> children that age, but it's not fun to watch. Yeah, it's just uh, genuinely annoying. So in that way, it's very accurate. 
I want like to be charming. Well, I mean, I mean, it's it's cute, but I just sort of imagine myself in uh, Yasuko's place, and I'd probably punch her across the room or something. I mean, Caitlin, you you willingly care for children day in and day out. <laughs> yeah. Your perspectives are slightly different. I mean, the, my my the children I take care of are um, a little young for that behavior, because um, they're two or almost two. So when they say poop, it generally means that they have pooped. Oh. <laughs> they haven't found the inherent hilar- They haven't found the inherent hilarity of bodily functions. That sounds even less appealing to me, to be honest. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, uh, on that note, though, I do think it's uh, uh, especially after you mention it, it's very uh, kind of William Gibson esque uh, in the way it portrays technology. Um, in fact, yeah, I think I was getting kind of flashbacks to like all the the hackers and talking about ice and stuff in. Uh, Count Zero, uh, one of those books. Now, can, who is William Gibson? Uh, he's like uh, this really uh, popular uh, Western sci-fi author, uh, pretty kind of credited with uh, predicting internet and hacking. Uh, I don't know if I should go that far. Like uh, a lot of the terms he used in his books ended up being what the actual things were called just because people had read his books and then kind of invented that same thing. So like he had ice, which is basically kind of like a firewall. Um, before firewalls were created, uh, and that became one of the terms for firewalls just because the people who ended up making the concept post-Gibson coming up with it first had read his books and just started calling it the things that he'd call it. So uh, he t- okay. he's uh, credited with, like, kind of prognosticating a lot of the technological developments maybe, like, ten, five to ten years before they come out uh, in his books. Really great author. Uh, uh, Johnny Mnemonic was one of his books. I don't know if he's gotten too many movie adaptations. Uh, I like Johnny Mnemonic, although it's got pretty mixed reviews. All right, William Gibson is good, <laughs> yeah. is what I was saying. Yeah, but <laughs> anyway, yeah, this is a lot cuter than uh, a lot of his stuff. Um, I think I'm pretty much on Vry right now, where I'm kind of interested and it's thrown some like cool ideas at me. But I can tell they're kind of slow burning it, and they're trying to head into something. But they need to like kind of lay a lot of groundwork and relationships first. So. Uh, I'm not like super engaged, but I'm kind of uh, interested as to where the series will go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as it I'm turns at. out, I don't watch a lot of two core shows anymore either. So yeah. that's also a shift in. Oh yeah, th- <laughs> I remember how these are paced. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. See, I I actually prefer the two core pacing um, because I'm old. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> no, you got to feed it to me right now. All of your information and visual symbolism all at once. <laughs> that worked really well for Yuri Kuma Arashi. Just want to mainline it. Oh, God. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yuri Kuma Arashi, which I couldn't fix despite loving Ikuhara. Or couldn't fix, couldn't finish. I, I do like that show, but holy God, is it a mess that needed two cores? Anyway, Deno Coil. Anyway, Deno, <laughs> Deno Coil. Um, so, yeah, I do think they sort of throw a lot at you in these um, first few episodes, but in a very, like, table-setting way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, they want you to get a sense of the world and a sense of the characters and their history, Um, which I really liked about it. I I liked that um, there is a, like, these characters did not just sort of appear into the world um, at the point where the series starts, like the um, relationships between them is very like believable for the age. Mm-hmm. Um, and just like, I mean, the first time I watched it, there were times when I had some trouble keeping up because they do kind of throw a lot of terminology at you. Um, most of which without uh without explaining it and they kind of expect you to keep up. I do love that kind of context clue world. Building yeah. Though. Like that's my shit. No, that's true. Like I think it is, I, 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 I think it's, you know, better than like super clumsy exposition. Um, and when they did have exposition in this, like it was at points where I felt natural, like, okay, yeah, Yuko wouldn't know this. The other characters wouldn't know this, but like, um, there are times when it like, <sighs> You know, with the uh, attention deficit disorder, it gets a little hard to, like, sometimes fully keep up because it's like a, oh, I spaced out for a little bit too long and they, like, introduce this concept and I don't really know uh, 
what they're talking about anymore. <laughs> yeah, I genuinely prefer, like, literally them not even bothering to explain over having 10 minutes where they explain the specific mechanics in a very, yeah. like, kind of just, uh, what do you call it? Where they just, like, data dump you, and it's just not fun, it's not interesting, and, like, you understand it, but why did they do that? You, you mean that thing that sci-fi, that cheap sci-fi anime does, where a character monologues for a really long time, where we pan over still shots of scenery? Yep. And it all sounds very dramatic and important and really, really boring? Uh, yeah. Actually, you just kind of described one of the hallmarks of uh, Mamoru Oshii, except usually that's just why capitalism is bad. Yeah, and I mean, like, it's in Deno Coil, it's all, like, pretty grounded in, in real-life tech. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, like... Most of it isn't, like, spoofing and firewalls and stuff. It's not totally, like, unfamiliar concepts. Um, I do have a question for you. So, uh, yes. What are these, these rocks that they're trying to get? The, uh, oh, what are they called? Metabugs. Yeah, are metabugs blockchain? How dare you? I mean, they're, they're valuable data, right? And you can't, just, uh, you can't just make your own. They do literally mine them at one point. <sighs> yeah. Maybe they predicted blockchain. <laughs> I wish... See, this is the disadvantage to recording without using video, cause um, and also, you know, our listeners wouldn't get it anyway. But cause I just gave my monitor the most withering stare <laughs> when you said that, Peter. Okay. Mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I think like the metabugs are. The, it's sort of interesting because it sort of taps into that s- sense of childhood. Um real in a a realistic way because metabugs are functionally useless like they're just sort of packets of buggy data um that are just junk code Mm -hmm. um and like but they're pretty and you know the children have set a value on them so they have you know they have value in in their you know, twelve year old world. Like the flor the florist lady, like she probably doesn't give two shits about metabugs. But they are a, a system of bartering for them. It's like, you know, Pokemon cards are just like little slips of paper. Yeah. I unless you play the game, but you, like most people I knew who collected Pokemon cards didn't play. Or literally shiny river rocks or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like or like gum, you know? They're the they're these things that are like pretty much worthless to like in the adult world but you know in the world of a preteen they're a really huge deal there is something kind of nice about the fact that these kids are you know they're cute but they're not precious which i don't see as often as i like i like the they're cute but they're not like like yeah you like you said they're not like super precious and like they're not really like they're they're sort of you know they look like twelve year olds they move like twelve year olds they're not like lolly fodder you know, it, God no um definitely not yeah definitely didn't get any of that like made in abyss type uh leery eye stuff that yeah I got to watch this show no without one... being completely terrified that I think shit was gonna go bad at yeah. any second it was exciting yeah no it it's a show about twelve year olds that with absolutely no fan service whatsoever. I, the the only moment that did kind of make me want to quietly die is when they uh, when they dip into the pigtail pulling shit. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, with the so, the uh, with with, Daichi's crush. Yeah, uh, Fumie. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Yasuko is like, "Oh, you're just you're very dense, aren't you, Fumie?" Um, and it's just like, <sighs> and I'm because yeah. the thing, like, I I like the um. For the most part, I like the way the show handles um, gender relations. And, like, so when we were um, talking about who was going to be on this episode, I was like, I kind of want someone who was once, you know, a 12 year old boy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, which, Peter, I believe you fit that bill. Yeah, uh, maybe I'm just um, unusual. Never, never pulled girls' pigtails. Uh, never. No, I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying you did, but, like, um, there's that sort of sense of like you know they were when they were little kids they were friends but like they hit a point around the start of adolescence where like the boys and girls sort of started to pull apart and separate a little bit um 
-hmm. which is, you know, like, I'm not saying that that's how it has to be, but that is normal um, for like, you know, Jap for Japan, Japanese culture and for our culture as well. Oh, yeah. And like a lot of the uh, kind of uh, what, how, what I want to call it, this like really kind of toxic group think they have where, you know, certain ones mm-hmm. of them are braver or they, they uh, I don't know. It's like uh, you are constantly having to prove yourself and show a strong face. Uh, that mm-hmm. was very elementary school. So I think that that felt really true to life. I do think that there was a little bit of a sense when Fumie was talking about how Daichi used to be annoying, there was a little bit of a sense of, oh, well, boys will, will be boys, mm-hmm. um, which was really annoying. Yeah, it's, it's a shame because uh, I, I, I like Fumie and I really like her friendship with Yasuko. I think that's really nice. And, and I enjoyed watching them kind of hang out and be dorks together in that way that, that kids can do when they have a shared interest and like that's all that they need. Mm-hmm. Like, that's fun. I, I enjoy watching that. I kind of I kind of hope there's no romance at all in the series, even of the awkward preteen kind. I probably won't get my wish. I never do. But, <laughs> but like, the friendship relationships are so nice, even with between, like, the girls and, uh, and Haraken, who is, like, distinctly marked out as older looking, and he's mature because he knows about death and shit. I don't know if I would say he's mature. I think he's... Sad boy. Sad boy. Yeah. I think he's he's depressed. Yeah. He is deeply well, just in that sense that like he's clearly got visual markers of he looks he looks a little bit taller than the other boys, just right. being the same age. You know, mm-hmm. he's got that sad expression and he doesn't talk much. Yeah, it's you actually know, the been... same with uh with uh, Isako as well. They're both kind of taller and they are mm-hmm. uh more quiet and uh she's a bit meaner, but uh <laughs> She's like, trash and yeah. I love her. Yeah, yeah. She's Isako's not a nice girl. So and I want, did want to talk a little bit about um, Isako specifically, um, because I think the show does some really interesting things with her, um, even starting with these episodes. Um, like when, you know, when she first transfers into the class, she is not friendly when, you know, the boys approach her, when Daichi approaches her. And their and their response is to bully her because like how dare this stuck up girl not want to join their little club um and yasuko's first impulse is to be like oh you know well if you try being nicer to people and she's like fuck off Mm -hmm. i didn't do anything Um, which I thought was really interesting, um, for the show to specifically confront, um, because I think these sorts of, A, I think these sorts of bullying situations that you see in anime tend to be more girl on girl. Mm -hmm. So it was good to see that, like, a show recognized that, no, boys can be just as, as vicious, um, and underhanded bullies as, uh, as girls can be. Um, because I feel like just an anime boys always come off better that way. Right. It's always like, oh, well, girls can be so cruel. Not boys, though. Uh, but not boys. Boy, and, and I think that's sort of like a, a common notion as well. Like, at, yo, in the U.S. too, that like, girls are these like underhanded, like vicious monsters at that age, while boys just sort of want to... I don't know what boys want to do at that age. Well, you know, women do be competing. It's it's a known mm-hmm. quantity. And yeah, but she's she's not nice, but she like also like doesn't just put up with it. She doesn't try to make up with them. Um, she kind of destroys them. Uh, <laughs> destroys yeah. them. Yeah, she destroys them and then takes takes them over. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it does feel like a little bit of an, an out for the show that basically the way it resolves that plot is she has to be like 50 times cooler and better and more competent than everybody else to make the bullying stop but Mm -hmm. also i appreciate the attempt Mm -hmm. yeah well you know and it's one of those cases where if each girl girls um was in isolation if she were the only girl in the series or the only prominent female character like it probably wouldn't come off as well Mm -hmm. but like since there are like you know, three female characters as the leads, um, 
and they all have very different personalities um it feels the variety makes it feel a lot more natural and a lot more acceptable um and they do have like fairly naturalistic personalities overall mm -hmm. yeah um i was thinking about that with with uh kana the dead girl where we're like that would be mm -hmm. shitty fridging in just about any anime but it's mm -hmm. it's one of those be because there is this wide variety of female characters it softens the blow a lot you know you've got like three generations of uh female characters you know you've got the you've got yasuko isuko fumie you've got a uh, harken's aunt and you've got megaba who's amazing she's very good i'm about it mm. <laughs> she, she, you know <laughs> this crazy old Science hacker grandma. woman <laughs> oh my gosh it's good She's like, if a Gundam professor were a woman and insane, well, I guess most Gundam pro professors are insane. Um, <laughs> She's pretty notable, she, too, because I, I, it really shows that a lot of adults aren't really tech savvy. Like, barely any of them even mm -hmm. wear the goggles. Uh, and here's this old lady, like, who's basically got, like, a side hustle selling, like, hacking tools to children. Mm-hmm. Uh, right, because... I mean, the technology to them is is toys, like, mm -hmm. you know, for adults, it's kind of utility. You know, it's something that they've been introduced it to as an adult, as adults are, you know, as older. And so it's something that they use when they need to. But for the kids, it's like an integral part of their lives. Yeah, the scene where they uh, deactivate their glasses is is very cute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a very typical scene that manages to be not too not very uh you know you kids today because because it's so well established that this is integral and part of everyday life and it's not a fad that they need to go outside and stop using. It's although I I did I'll admit that I laughed more than once when this whole anime from two thousand seven is predicated on in the future we will all have google glass and then <laughs> i mean but at the same time like if google glass were better not used exclusively by douche bros yeah um maybe it wouldn't have been wrong and maybe like google glass was too early because like i could see augmented reality becoming more and more of a thing um, I will yeah, say, what happens to the people happen. in this world who need, like, corrective corrective eyewear? Are they just out of luck? Is it built into the glasses? I, I would guess so. Eh. Uh, <laughs> I thought I was thinking about that. You know, maybe it's like um, Barnaby in uh, Tiger and Bunny where... His, <laughs> his blind eye, his oh, He just squints. His, 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 his suit has correct... His suit corrects his vision. Well, I got the feeling um, she got, like, uh, hers actually look like glasses, right? So I, I don't mm -hmm. know if she was given those as a kid. It seems like she actually got them kind of early. She just didn't make very mm -hmm. good use of them, uh, whereas all these other kids... I guess the other kids were kind of in an environment where you get really good at hacking really quickly, whereas she was kind of isolated and didn't have any reason to figure that kind of stuff out. Well, um, hers seemed specifically connected to Densuke to begin with, who is a good puppy. Yeah. He's a good boy. You were very upset, Vry, when you thought Densuke was not going to This make entire it out. first okay. episode is about putting a dog in peril. Yeah. There need to be warnings for that. Oh, but he was so I love I loved the part where he like jumped out and attacked the illegal cuz it's like it was just like hell yeah. Like you thought this goofy looking dog was just going to be a mascot character, but like he's just fucking just fucking up this like weird thing that like is wrong and seems threatening that's amazing it's like if that annoying little dog from kill to kill was instead awesome and great mm -hmm. <laughs> i did uh notice that uh when i guess that was like her grandpa's pet before but he seemed afraid of her at first like kind of in a i'm wondering if there's anything more to that like in more than just this is a stranger kind of way yeah because you would think that since he is virtual like he he's not a real dog he would be programmed to be friendly. Uh, to be friendly and wouldn't really have anything to be afraid of 
uh, barring weird glitches that corrupt his programming. Unless, like, they want to give you, the the owner, the feeling of, like, oh, I saved oh, this dog. I won this dog <laughs> over. Yeah. Okay. Man, that would be some next level stuff, but okay, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> some, some people like projects. Yeah, yeah. Some people so like pets. saving people. All right. Uh, on, that, on that subject, actually, I did think it was interesting. Uh, we were talking about, uh, what was his name? Hurricane's uh, friend, Kana. Uh, mm-hmm. She was specifically killed by a vehicle that was uh, on autopilot, mm-hmm. uh, which is, I was just like, wow, that's super topical uh, watching it today. Because uh, I think, yeah, yeah, just like a couple weeks ago, uh, somebody was hit by, uh, I don't know if it was a Google or an Uber uh, autonomous car. Um, which has gotten into this debate about how the cars, whether they're programmed to save the pedestrian or the driver, and just by virtue of the fact that they're a product that people would want to buy for themselves, they would have to be designed to prioritize the driver's life uh, if, right. if put into that situation, because who's going to buy a car that would prioritize somebody else's life when you're inside it? So I, I'm, I'm sure there's probably something else to... Like, all these glitches are going to have negative effects, which is the whole reason why they have searches. Uh, so maybe there was some sort of mm-hmm. responsibility among all these hacker kids going around everywhere that might have driven that car off course, uh, or government conspiracy or something maybe. Um, but it's it kind usually of, a it, government conspiracy. Yeah, it is kind of a, a very, uh, I think, kind of on the nose kind of concern about handing that much um, kind of agency over to technology, giving it the ability to control mm-hmm. like several ton fast moving vehicles uh that uh was is pretty it's kind of like an impressive look forward at future dangers because i mean that's what's happening now right i don't know i don't right. think any kids have been hit or anything but uh it, that's like some really good prediction i guess i mean that's always the struggle with sci-fi stories about you know the dangers of technology right is can they stick that landing between you know technology is a uh is a double-edged sword that is also integral to our lives, or I don't know, we should all just probably go back to living on farms in uh, Smallville. Just not worry about it. <laughs> oh, Arjuna. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, man. We should do an episode about Arjuna. <laughs> that would be wild. Uh, <laughs> sure, I'll get mad on, on, on air for an hour. <laughs> anyway. No, but anyway... <laughs> No, and one of the things I like about the show is that it's not really, like, a dystopia or a utopia. It's just different. You know, technology sort of changes the way that the characters interact with the world, and it's not really, like, saying for or against anything. Um, And it's not saying, like, oh, well kids these days don't know how to uh, go out and enjoy themselves because internet um, Mm -hmm. you know it's it's like you know they're just doing things differently like they still play they just play with these like crazy toys and their play feels like things feel so life and death for them but like if you look at it like if you were to look at it from an adult perspective like it's not and i think that show the show really balances uh that that sort of sense really well it's very and i think pokemon go type playing (laughs) yeah i was about Um, to say um it's it's interesting that this the world building here goes for what looks like a complete virtual overlay of everything even mm -hmm. if it's exactly the same rather than doing a pokemon go style thing where it's just the object you're interacting with against the natural background yeah, and that's sort of, um, I don't, the show doesn't, it, they don't really do a good job of establishing it, but that's sort of like Daikoku City is like an experiment with doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, like, that's not like commonplace everywhere. It's like, you know, it's why Yasuko is not like immersed in like everything when she gets there. Like, it seems to be unique to that city. Yeah. Um, and Searchy. <laughs> Searchy is so perfect because Searchy is just a debugging software, right? Like it's just it, like citywide antivirus, um, and most people don't think twice about Searchy. Searchy's a cop, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but since the kids are have all of these like slightly illegal toys, like then Searchy is 
terrifying. Right? It's it's like the AR equivalent of, oh shit, I got Napster. They're yeah. gonna find my lime wire. <laughs> That's one of the things, um, I don't know whether this is intentional or uh, not, uh, but I they don't really kind of... Because uh, the kids are always scared of Searchy, uh, even though, like, or even, like, all of these things, like them firing missiles at each other and stuff, because they know it could, they act like it is something that could hurt them, but it's just, it doesn't exist, right? Um, right. It's it's in this, like, virtual overlay of the city that doesn't actually interact with the physical world, at least not yet. Um, so I, there's kind of no reason to be afraid of Searchy, because he's not really there, he can't touch them or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh and I think they even establish if they turn their glasses off, then it kind of uh, removes their avatar. Uh, so, like, searches won't come after them if their glasses are off because none of their stuff's active, I, I guess is the idea. Uh, which means anytime they're encountered by searches, they could just remove their glasses, turn them off, and then they're safe. Um, they can't see searches, Searchy can't see them. Um, and I don't know if it's kind of... Uh, supposed to be kind of a childlike thing of they don't really think that way like because it was kind of a revelation to them when they first tried that when they went to the florist right they're like why don't we do this and they're like oh i, I live i never even thought of that because when they were in the uh the like bus yard uh that just like the whole place was on fire it wasn't really on fire but it looked like the whole place was on fire their avatars were gonna be destroyed literally no kid just said well why don't i just turn my glasses off and then i'm safe uh so i don't know like how legitimate a strategy that is at all times or if it's just their kids so they kind of just buy into this alternative reality and they don't really consider it to be separate from their own or not like what does that that line actually lie right right yeah no um and i do think part of it is just that like the glasses are so integral uh for them that like the idea of just turning it off is uncomfortable to them Mm. you know i mean like you know a lot of people will not like they won't even like leave the room without their phones um the idea of like just like putting down your phone and walking away just unplugging for like an hour is just like what uh so like yeah i mean it it sort of it makes sense to me and they're all like sort of carrying these like um hacked things that megaba made for them it, uh, <laughs> it kind of so. reminds me of the old Yu-Gi-Oh anime except this except much better uh much better introduced where, where that whole ser- like a good chunk of that series runs on people looking like they're in extreme pain every time they take a hit in the children's <laughs> card game whereas he- which is kind of what's going on here there's no real stakes except that there are because that's a lot of money when you're a kid and then you then you're out of your entire mm-hmm. friend group and your parents are probably going to get mad at you and they might ground you so it's it's surprisingly good at building up its own internal logic of what the stakes mm-hmm. are to make them feel life or death without it having to go into like this grimdark feeling of and then these children might die, which mm-hmm. you know you gotta escalate up to that I I presume. Yeah, um, I love that Megaba sells everything out of the dagashi shop, mm-hmm. um, which for context, in case anyone listening doesn't know, um, is like sort of like a cheap kids uh candy store like where everything is like a couple hundred yen so Um, a penny candy store which we yeah a penny candy store um so like you know and it really creates a sense that like these things are toys um they're like they're things for kids to play with that's just sort of a different world than it that's a separate world from what the adults live in and I just think it's really cool how they, they build up that sense of it. It, it is. I, I want to. It stuck out to me, I think, because it hadn't been happening. And then it happens once kind of near the end of this, the, uh, the, the run of episodes we watched where, you know, normally in shows about kids, adults just aren't there and teenagers mm-hmm. are super old. 
and for the most part, this right. show just has actual children and actual adults. And then there's the working woman 17-year-old, I guess. Um, did they say how old she's supposed to be? I thought it, I thought it said 17, because that, um, he, she yells it at Haken for calling her, uh, Abachan. Yeah, she definitely doesn't yeah. like the implication that she's older, but, I mean, that's pretty anime. What is her name? Yeah. Tamako. Tamako. Yeah, I could have sworn it said she was still a teenager, but. Yeah, you know, I think, um, I do, later on they show her, like, at school. So, Yeah. I mean, but they, you know, they still also have they their teacher who is um, uh, still a f- who remains a oh, Haraken is a uh, Romy Park. Um, oh, that explains why I instinctively like him. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but anyway, I was saying, um, shit, what was I saying? <laughs> uh, adults, adults who are good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, there are adults who are involved. Um, there are teachers. Uh, not not an incidental character. She sticks around. Daichi was a little shit to her. Daichi's just... I- I'm sure he will become useful and grow as a person. And right now, God, I want him to die. I hate that character type. Yeah. Um, um, he is... He ties in with the realism... Which is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, it's like all his friends are nice. They're, they're, they're brattier in a way that's like, you know, you're, you're 12, whatever. That's that's a terrible age. But but also, I don't hate you. Right. Like, we see a little bit of his, like, his family. Like, everyone makes sense as a character. And it's not an excuse, but it, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um... Like every, everyone, there every everything feels very grounded um, throughout the series. Um, yeah, I will admit yeah. I'm looking forward to I guess discovering why you picked this show for the podcast beyond the fact that you know it's good and it has a lot of interesting female characters. I think that was a major part <laughs> of it. <laughs> no, I I mean, and also it I don't think it's um, appreciated enough. It doesn't really like. I mean, it doesn't really, like, have anything, like, major to say about femininity, but I thought it was really cool that there's this show that, like, has a gender-balanced cast with, um, you know, female main characters that, and, like, you know, preteen characters who are realistic and not shown in this sort of very um, fan service way. And there, I mean, there are themes that, are applicable to anime you know anime feminists but there's like you know it's i wouldn't necessarily say like it's it's the feminist or not feminist themes but is it feminist caitlin what does the Uh, checkbox say (laughs) yeah i have to uh i hadn't really heard of deno coil too much except for um i think natasha mentioned it where were we Mm -hmm. it was uh just after the welcome to the ballroom panel at ax last year i think it was because uh, somebody from Deno Coil was working on Welcome to the Ballroom. And past that, I hadn't heard too much of it, but uh, just watching it, I'm kind of getting really big Serial Experiments Lane vibes, except the show is much, much more approachable. So if it kind of Again. wants to tackle the same themes, I think it would probably be a better show to watch if you're wanting to recommend that kind of thing, because Lane is is a really difficult watch unless you're super into that kind of stuff. Uh, it's kind of, um, oh, what's the, the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's not friendly. Deliberately obtuse? Yes, that's, a, that's also a good one. Yes, it certainly is. Uh, oh, uh, it can't be easy on this show that it's really hard to find, because if you Google it, uh, the spelling is D-E-N-N-O-U coil, but on High Dive, which is where it's legally streaming right now, you can only find it if you search D-E-N dash N-O-H coil. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why they decided to uh, romanize it that way because, like, the the like the cult fan like it's it 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 it's not a cult hit, but it definitely has a cult following, and it has always been spelled uh, D E N N O U. Yeah, that's how its Wikipedia D-E-N-N-O pages currently. Oh, with the dash. 
Mm-hmm. So I don't know why they made that choice. It seemed it seems poorly thought out, but sort of that is what does it is what it Daniel is. Daniel mean in this case? Because uh, Dan, um, Dan is electric something. Uh, and no is brain. Oh, so it's electric brain. And then uh, they always say in like the eye catches coil means like a group of children or something. Uh, yeah. yeah. So electric brain children group or something. So I feel like that would be either, it would be one word if that's the case. So it would be D-E-N-N-O or D-E-N-N-O-U. But instead this, it's got this weird dash. I don't know why. Is this the first time it's been licensed? Like just now as for high yeah. dive? Or, okay. Because there is definitely an interesting thing going on with the subtitles where I thought, oh, these must be old subtitles. That's why I'm getting horrifically uncomfortable every talk about the gl- they talk about the glitches called illegals. Mm-hmm. I think uh, it, well, it's been licensed, I mean, but it was kind of in this weird, uh, I, maybe it was just had a physical release or something, because it, it, it wasn't available to stream for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's trying to... So it, it, it's licensed by Made in Japan, which is a new uh, license, relatively new licensing state, uh, studio. Okay. Hmm. Um... The subs are trying so hard to find a balance between using, like, relatable chat speak that they think will be around for a while, but also not, you know, to convey these these hacker terms while also not getting too deep into dating themselves. I, I admire that right. effort. I, I don't... They called Isako a um, cryptologist, but, I mean, I, like, the fan subs, like, I... I am not, you know, saying fan subs are generally better or more accurate, but sometimes, like, it's six of one, half dozen of another, and people tend to prefer the first thing they saw. And the fan subs called her a coder, which makes more, I feel like, is a more natural situation for the... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> more natural translation for the context, but... I, I suppose it doesn't sound as mystical, which might be what they were going for, but it yeah. certainly conveys intent better. Mm-hmm. About the illegal thing, like the Japanese, it's literally just irigaru. Ah, so it's just an unfortunate relic of 2007. Pretty much. Um, I mean, it is a different context, mm-hmm. right? Right. But yeah, so... <laughs> Oh, I'm looking at Made in Japan. It looks like it's another Sentai, uh, uh, Section 23 Sentai holding. Just one of those, like, divisions that I think it's, like, uh, has mm-hmm. some of the former ADV titles. That's where I, uh, they pro- I probably got Pat Labor, Dominion Tank Police, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. So Yeah, because I think the thing with Dono Coil, the reason that it never really got uh, a U.S. release before now is in 2007... 2007, I think, was very unfortunate timing for anime to be coming out. Because mm-hmm. it was just as the bubble was bursting. Right. But it was before streaming. Yeah, that was a rough couple of years. Like, 2007 to 2012 was rough um, for anime. Well, streaming became a thing in, like, 2011. Crunchyroll was founded in uh, 2006. So well, yeah, I but, know what I said. Know, it was a fan. Yeah. <laughs> it was a fan sub. No, that's that's when it was founded as a, a, a um, legitimate company with licensed um, anime. So I mean, like there there is of course a gap in time uh, between when a company starts and when it necessarily takes off. I don't I don't know what the mm-hmm. I I I joined way later, so I don't know like what the viewership numbers look like during that period. So I mean, even if <laughs> the, even if there were legitimate streaming options available, and there definitely were mm-hmm. in two thousand six. Um, it, it might limited. not have got became like a recognized way of getting getting access to anime at that point. Yeah. Right. Well, here's okay. So here's my metric. I lived in Japan from October 2010 to May 2012, mm-hmm. um, and it was somewhere in that period when the streaming revolution really started. Streaming revolution really started to pick up because. When I left, fan subs were the norm. When I came back, everything was streaming. Well, not everything, but it was when, like, streaming was sort of becoming expected for the new series coming out. Mm-hmm. And it was still on the um, one week. De- it must have been 2011 because I remember Tiger and Bunny streamed on one week delay. 
Right, on Hulu, mm-hmm. which I think was a relatively, like, it was a relatively new idea. I think that was a really early simulcast. No. Yes, it was, and it gave me feelings, really <laughs> painful feelings. Anyway. <laughs> Someday we'll do that Tiger and Bunny episode. Someday. My children. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, I, I mean, I do think all that talk is is relevant. You know, this is so much a series about technology and uh, the conveyance thereof and communication and and whatnot and and how the changing norms like you mentioned between generations you know it's remarked on as a remarkable thing when the florist has a pair of glasses as though it's like this huge gulf that kind of de facto isolates our protagonists despite the fact that there are adult support you know structures around them they're not really in heinous danger but they're still in that kind of fantasy way in their own world. Mm-hmm. And you do get a, yeah. a big, like, I think one of the things that I noticed most about the series is it really kind of sold this sense of, like, cultural transition uh, because uh, they even established that Daikoku City is uh, kind of like a testing ground for this new technology, right? Uh, and then the searches uh, are, they said that it's under the jurisdiction of the Postal Service, I guess, which is why they can't go into shrines or schools or, I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, private homes, that would probably be a problem with that. Um, but that means that there's still, like, a lot of bureaucratic mechanisms that are getting in the way of this system being efficiently run. And then there's the adults who haven't quite, uh, or will maybe never kind of accept this mm-hmm. new technology. Uh, and there's all these glitches and problems with the system that they're sort of um, bringing in. Uh, they, they, like, serve plot purposes, but at the same time, you can also see how uh, they are problems with the system that probably never were predicted, um, and they they're still being ironed out. So that they you get the sense that there, this really is kind of like a beta ground for something that might be used everywhere one day, where there's still a lot of issues they're trying to iron out and try to figure out how like all the different uh, government mechanisms can work together and agree upon this so that they can like so like searches could make sure that school systems aren't broken or anything like that so i i think that it you do feel like they're kind of on the precipice of this big change in the way the world works uh and this is kind of like the very messy beginnings of this kind of technology Mm -hmm. my one quibble with the realism that they create a sense of in the show is why are all the colors so mute muted everything has this kind of like tan ish filter and you would think in a children's series about children playing with basically these you know technologically advanced toys feeling like everything is larger than life in life or death you would think the colors would be so much brighter yeah i'll be honest the the i mean i like the writing so far um the designs are fine they're functional and some of them are neat, which I assume we'll see more of later. But as far as the actual direction, like shot composition and uh, the chosen color scheme, it's it's fine. The, the only scene that felt like exceptionally lively and like it really took advantage of the possibilities was the um, the the missile scene where, where yeah. um, Isako is being chased. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think as, like I believe as we get more into more into everything, um sort of things will start becoming more alive and more visually dynamic. Um, But yeah, like I just, yeah, I mean, you would, you would think things would look more vibrant because real life is colorful. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. it's very world war two kind of gray color palette uh, kind of thing. And yeah, I mean, like after watching summer wars, I just kind of expect internet stuff to be hyper psychedelically colored, especially when Mm -hmm. it's all these like, hacky programs made by kids who have like no aesthetic taste built up yet it, it would everything would probably look garish um but it's all very mundane looking and like sticking with the the real life very like bled out color palette that they're using yeah and i mean there are definitely some nascent themes going on here about um mm-hmm. reality and technology interacting you know with that scene where uh, isako is really worried about a glitch breaking down uh, in a real space quote unquote or that scene where uh where kyoko puts her play-doh on top of densuke's head and it stays there 
you know, that kind of, I, I, I'm sure they're going to build out on that later, but for now... Um, it might have been virtual Play-Doh. We just don't know. We yeah. just don't know. Was the Play-Doh real? That's the big question we're hoping to answer. By the <laughs> did the Play-Doh fall over? Yeah. It was, yeah, did it just fall right through him into the floor, but, like, she thought it was on his head? Big questions. Yep. I just... There's just there's just one thing that I've been wanting to point out and I never managed to segue into it. Mm-hmm. That just that I love like I'm so 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 happy about the lack of fan service about the lack of sexualization of these children. It's um, great like and the, a low you know, bar. The, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> what a great low bar. At, <laughs> like at this age, like the the way they're drawn it's realistic like there's this sense that these girls are like at the very very cusp of starting puberty they're bigger than the boys um they're not like hi i'm 12 and i have a perfectly hourglass figure like um i mean there are girls who get boobs early but like you know not like in anime they do right like right but but they're also not like like Kana and Dragging Maid, where I want the I need the camera to stop focusing on her thighs every right. time she sits they down. There's no absolute territory going on. They're not wearing thigh high stockings. Yeah, like, it's also not putting them in um, positions where they're like compromised like that. I I mm-hmm. think I think Maiden Abyss is actually a really good comparison because uh, I mm-hmm. wouldn't say Maiden Abyss has like sexualized character designs. Uh, they both have very like built out uh, like very deliberate worlds that they're trying to create. Um, but Maiden Abyss just consistently puts its characters into situations. Uh, mm-hmm. to yeah, do I'm not waiting no to one... hear that the author of Deno Coil has been arrested in a couple of years. Yeah. <sighs> no one wets their pants. Yeah, that's great. Um, God. Oh, Maiden Abyss. Anyway. Um, and, like, the one, like, there's, like, one shot where Isako is supposed to met, be look alluring, and that is... Strictly from Daichi's point of view. She's drinking a soda. Because, yeah, she's drinking a soda because, um, they are, the (laughs) boys seem to regard the girls with this mix of scorn and terror, which I am told is very real for the, for boys that age. Peter, how do you feel about that? Uh, Scorn and terror. (laughs) <laughs> I, I wouldn't know. I don't know if that's my personal experience, but uh, I guess I wouldn't be surprised based on some of my elementary school interactions that I remember. <laughs> I mean, I definitely felt a lot of scorn for boys at that age. Oh, <laughs> um, so is there anything else that you uh, really liked or disliked about the show that you want to go into? Uh, I'm I'm excited to see where it goes from here. You know, this is the kind of show where I'm usually just hanging out and waiting for the second core where it's done establishing all of its relevant themes and it can mm-hmm. kind of play with them. So interesting to see what they choose as the, uh, you know, the episode 13 mini climax. Yeah. Oh, you know, episode 13 is, um, you know, you'll get there when the you get episode. there. Oh, that's a good sign. <laughs> that's a uh, thank you for that. Um, no, episode 13 is considered one of the show's best episodes. Okay, wow. Um, I'll, I'll leave you with that. Um, do you guys have any predictions for what's coming up? Predictions? What's going yeah, is this just like something yeah. we can uh, load up later if we, we were totally right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say, like, my prediction, just so that I can, like, load it up if I'm right, is that they're all actually in a virtual world. Let's, do, let's go with that one. Uh what a twist. Yeah, yeah. As far as <laughs> what I'm really hoping for, I think I'm pretty much with Varai on this one. I like with a with a 24 episode series, uh, you you know you're going to kind of hit uh, it's going to be a lot of establishing the the setting, kind of some like lazier episodes and then the big turn going into the second core where the show gets serious about what it's doing. So, I'm curious as to like the show's done a really good job of uh, building up a very convincing world uh and i kind of want to just know like what what mm-hmm. its plans are which it sounds uh, like i'm hoping to. i mean I've, i know i've been spoiled by satoshi Kon, but i'm kind of hoping the second half gets a little trippy all right also um while well, we're just throwing out guesses yeah uh isako is working for uh Haruken's sister that that's who okay. she was talking to on the phone hmm Oh, okay. Uh, you mean his aunt? 
Oh, yep, there okay, we go. Okay, the motorcycle girl. Mm-hmm. Atomico. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. okay. All right. Just real quick. Real quick. I want to go over the mysteries that have been brought up in these six episodes. There is Isako's hacking ability. There is Kana. There is 4423. Yeah, yeah. I wrote that down. Um, what else is there? Isako is the Edward Elric of hacking, isn't she? <laughs> I mean, she has a weird bleeding eye, so yeah. it's not actually bleeding, but like... No hands. Um, will Miss Maiko ever get married? Okay, yeah. Hey, let's. What if we uh, dropped that and never spoke about it again? <laughs> that would be amazing. No, it's really just. It's really just Daichi being shitty. I'll tell you that one yeah. right Yay. away. It's just. It's just Daichi being a shitty teenage boy, like being like, "Oh well, why aren't you married yet?" You know, and sort of re- you know repeating this sort of macho. Uh, like, oh, if a woman Miss Maiko's age is working and not married, then she must be, you know, uh, th- then that must be, like, what she is uh, after. Mm-hmm. What else? What other? Are there any other mysteries? They set up uh, a lot. Wh- why, um, why illegals are jumping into pets. Ah, yes. And the whole illegal thing, i.e. one of the major... <laughs> Plot points. Yeah. Isako seems to specifically be after some weird illegal code mm-hmm. for unknown reasons. Yeah. Isako's whole thing. She's her whole thing is that uh is a mystery. Mm-hmm. Like, what the fuck is her deal? Because she's got a deal for sure. Um so I think that wraps up the episode. I think so. I think so. So next we'll time back. we're watching 7 to 13, right? Next, Yep, next time we'll be watching episode 7 to 13, which will take us halfway through the series. That's our episode. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, check out our website at animefeminist.com where we have a lot of other content about anime and feminism and also manga and games and what have you. Um, if you really like us, uh, please consider becoming a patron by supporting us on Patreon. Um, our Patreon is anime feminist and even a dollar a month really adds up and helps us enormously. Um, I believe we just started breaking even, but there are so many things that we would like to be able to add to the website. Things like, um, transcribing podcasts for, um, greater accessibility, um, convention visits things like that um so uh, whatever you can contribute uh would will help us reach those goals um you can also follow our twitter at anime feminist our facebook at anime fem and our tumblr at anime feminist once again thanks for listening and remember to spay and neuter your, your digital pets everyone oh, that's a good yes. intro. Nice. <laughs> <laughs>